Like the architect in the matrix, you have full control over how you expose data using GraphQL. In this episode, we tell you exactly how it's done on the server. Check it out. Hello and welcome to another episode of On.net. My name is Jeremy Lickness, and today we're continuing our GraphQL series. If you haven't seen the introduction, go check that out because today we're taking what we learned and looking at how you stand up a GraphQL endpoint. I'm here with Brandon Minnick again. Brandon, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. It's almost like you've been here all along. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about, we talked about GraphQL, but now I want to use it. Right. So I need to stand that up on my back end. What do I do? Absolutely. So you could start from scratch. GraphQL is a open source framework. It was created by Facebook, but it's now actually owned by the GraphQL Foundation, similar to the .NET Foundation. But what I recommend is a couple popular SDKs to help us get started. And the two most popular ones right now are GraphQL.net and Hot Chocolate. Okay. So GraphQL.net, it definitely is the most popular. It has millions of downloads on NuGet, and a lot of that is because it was the first GraphQL library for us .NET developers. But there's a rising star, an exciting new library called <laughs> Hot Chocolate that is quickly gaining traction. So. For today's demo, we'll use GraphQL.net, but highly recommend Hot Chocolate to anybody who's looking to uh, get started and learn more as well. And my understanding, if I understand GraphQL correctly, whatever SDK I go with, the way that I'm going to query and retrieve data is going to be the same. What's changing is the way I'm setting it up on the back end, correct? Yeah, essentially the, the syntax, their implementation, uh, maybe one uses attributes and the other uses properties. So okay, kind makes of sense. You know, choose the one that makes the most sense to you and the one you're most familiar with and most successful with. Cool. So, yeah, let's jump right into it. Let's, let's write some code. So I have here a uh, GraphQL library. Um, this is all done in .NET Core 3. And because it's all in .NET, I also have code for my mobile app in here, which we'll show off in our next section where we learn how to consume this API from our mobile app. Okay. But for now, let's go ahead and run this API just to show what it's doing right now. So right now, it's running here on my local host. And just like we learned in the last episode, we get graphical for free. So I didn't write any code. This just appears when I clicked Run. And also like we learned in the last episode, we get self-documenting code. So graph graphical automatically combs through my GraphQL backend and exposes all the types that are available for us to query. So what we're creating today is a favorite dogs app. I'm, <laughs> I'm a dog lover and you know it's always nice just to be able to have a look at your favorite dog on, on a mobile app. And so right now what we have in our GraphQL backend, we're able to query for one dog. So I can use what we learned in the last episode and we can type in a specific dog. So We'll type in my dog's name, Kirby. And then for that dog, there's a couple different properties that we've exposed. And so I can search for the is, title. Is there a way to ask for all properties, or do you have to spell out exactly what you want every time? There is not. So this is that was something that tripped me up at first, because I'm used to just querying a REST API. I'm used to just sure. saying, hit this get REST API and give me all the data. And so the first thing I would try, I would do something like this, where I would say, give me everything about Kirby. But, nope. but <laughs> yeah, it yells happen. at me, because I haven't specified the fields so that I want. it's a full opt-in model. Totally opt-in. OK. But now that we pass those in, well, we can get that information back about Kirby. So, sure. So this is great. But one of the benefits of GraphQL is we don't want to make multiple round trips. We only need to make one round trip with our GraphQL endpoint. And the way I've designed our endpoint right now, it can't return a list of dogs. So okay. let's go ahead and jump into the code and add that in. Sounds like a plan. So exploring our, our code here, we have, this, we have this images query. So this is what appears when we click on 
query. So right now we see one field that we can pass in a string for the dog's name, and it returns a dog object. And looking at the code, we see all the same information, but this is how we can generate that for our endpoint. So we tell it that we want to expose a field, and for GraphQL, we create a graph type for our model. So one cool thing about this is if I go to this declaration, um, we're using my dog images model. The dog images model, this is my C sharp object, just properties, getters, setters, nothing fancy, just breed, birthday, coat color. But for GraphQL, we can actually specify which fields we want to expose and which ones we don't. Got it. So things like uh, maybe we don't want to share the birth date. So if I wanted to, I could comment this out. And when we rerun our GraphQL API and jump back into that documentation explorer, what we'll see is now we can no longer query for the birthday. So, so we can expose as much or as little data from our model as we want. So it's not like if something exists in our database or in our code, we have to be able to return all of that. So I assume that from a security perspective, and we're not going to dive into that advance <laughs> on, on this show, but you could potentially, based on someone's authentication, restrict which fields they have access to as well. Right. OK, cool. Yeah, and so, so that's how we are exposing those fields. And we were saying we want to also be able to query for all the dogs. So what we'll generate here, we'll say we'll have another field underneath this query. And this will actually be a list. list graph type. And the type of that will be the dog images graph type. And then we just have to give it a little bit of information. So um, this is what we'll call it. So for the other one, we called it dog, because it just returns one dog. So we'll get really creative and call this one dogs. And the I description. Was on that one, by <laughs> the way. And for the description, we'll say uh, returns a list of dogs. And you know, when we're comparing this to the previous one, um, it's going to look a little different because the previous one had to have an argument where we passed in the dog's name. Right. Because we were only returning one dog, so we had to tell the user or ask the user which dog. Uh, for this, we're not going to require a specific parameter, a specific query argument. So we'll just jump down straight to what's called the resolver. And there we go. And so the resolver just tells the GraphQL endpoint how to get the data. So when they ask for this, this is how you resolve the request. Yep. So maybe this data is in a database, and we could point this to our, our SQL database. Uh, maybe we're building a GraphQL API in front of an existing suite of REST APIs. We could actually point this to existing REST APIs. Nice. So in this case, we'll point it to my, my dog images data, and we'll just tell it to get all of the dog images, and we're getting yelled at. Not all here. Oh, let's go ahead and stop running this. Doesn't like the live change. Oh, I see what I did. OK. I forgot to tell it, because we need to pass in a context. It just so happens I'm not using the, the current context here. This is just some. Uh, basically some dummy data that we're returning oh. back. OK. So now let's run it. And when we run this again, we'll see in our documentation explorer, we'll see the original dog query. But now, here's the new one we just created. So what we're able to do now is create that query where we can request all the dogs. But again, just like we said earlier, we can't just say, give me all the information about all the dogs. We have to actually specify which information we want. So we can get back the dog's name or the title of the image, the breed, and we'll select a couple of these. And there, and there we go. go. And now we have all this list of dogs. So we have Waffles and Whiskey and Toby, all my favorite dogs coming back from our new GraphQL API endpoint. So it sounds like you have full control over what you're returning. Doesn't matter if it's XYZ database. But you have an API that you basically say, when I ask for this, this is how you get it. And then once you do that, the client is off to the races. So it's not like, because I've heard some people say, we're passing control to the client, and they could just write any query 
and that's not a good thing, but you've got control over what's being passed in. And exactly. Yeah, just like with any API, we'll restrict or expose only the data we want. So right. we don't have to share any PII like birth dates or passwords or anything crazy like that because nobody needs to see that. Right. <laughs> Very good. All right. So if you're wondering where to find this code, it is all available on GitHub. And what we've done today, we've put together this web page that gives you links to the code, a couple of different sample apps. And if you want to learn more, there's also more information there where you can dive into the docs and start learning and building your first GraphQL API endpoint. Nice. So that's GraphQL on the back end. In the next episode, we're going to explore how to consume this data from a client. So tune in. Check it out, and thank you for joining us in on.net. Hi, I'm Jeremy Lickness. You've watched another episode of on.net. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss a show. And if you're interested in more shows, check out the link right here. Thanks.